<laughs> okay. <laughs> so this is lecture. So this is lecture 26 of ECE 2305. And in today's lecture, we're going to be talking about TCP reliable data transfer. So we're going to talk about something called fast retransmission. Um, and so I'm going to like sort of rearticulate uh, the idea of like the go back in and the uh, selective repeating ARQ. And we saw this before. We saw like, oh my god, like you know, in the, yesterday's quiz, you know, all these lines, yada yada yada, they go to receiver. Oh, one guy did not get his packet, and you know, we get all these acts back, and and the acts are telling us there's an issue here, folks. We're actually not, something's lost. And then the timeout occurs. Oh, and now we have, and you know, that takes forever, right? So what happens is. Is there a faster way of, of saying, there's an issue, can you please send me data? Right? So we'll look at that. We'll look at flow control. We'll look at how, end to end, uh, we can set up data, uh, the data transmission right, from the application layer at the sender to the application layer of a target receiver and make sure we don't sort of swamp the receiver. And then lastly, the congestion control is when our network is not behaving and we need to sort of throttle the information because of poor network conditions, all right? So, so okay, so we, we, we've seen RD, RDT before, right? So this is, like what we saw before, I think it was lecture 23, where we looked at RDT 0.0, RDT 2.0, 2.1, 2.2, and 3, right? So the different versions where we had like acknowledgments, NACs, and then we had timeouts, and that was all culminated in RDT 3.0, right? So what happens is in the TCP, um, you, what we've got to be mindful of is that TCP, when we have RTT, RDT service, it's, a, it's quite a bit different than I, uh, IP, okay? So let's go back to our diagram. Do, 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 do. Okay. Ah, here we go. It's always in the same place. So, uh, as a reminder, Tuesday. Beach ball. Okay? So just put as a note, happy. So, what happens is the following. We saw this before. And what we've got is we have the application layer, right, and the ports. And we have things like HTTP. We have things like um, the email, email server, right? Um, we might have other applications as well. And then we have the transport layer, right? And then, again, we have IP. And then we have network access layer, right? And then this connects to the network, right? And this is computer, computer, N. And so what happens is we saw that the IP layer in particular, uh, we have all these packets, right? So everything's in these datagrams. So it's all these, these little in, uh, encapsulations, if you will, of information that have a header, and then we just send it over to the internet. And what ends up happening is, let's say we, d we don't do any more packaging, what happens is these packets, these datagrams, go to the network and maybe there's a bunch of routers, right, before connecting to a target computer. And what happens is these packets might take very different paths, right, before they get reconstituted at computer M, which is great, but it also could be unreliable. So what happens is the transport layer is sort of that bridge. The transport layer here, okay, it forms a bridge between IP and its datagrams, right? So these small um, uh, sort of like uh, discrete segments of information and the application layer, which is a continuous stream of information potentially continuous stream of info. So really what happens is the transport layer um, really kind of serves that purpose. It takes that, it breaks it up, 
eventually getting it ready for IP, right, and the datagrams that's sent over the network. And what ends up happening, okay, in addition to that is it supports, it multiplexes and demultiplexes, just like what we saw in lecture 25. So it supports multiple applications running all at the same time, get from all these ports, and then has to um, mix and match all these different packets to send it down to the IP layer for continuation across the network. And then at the other end, reconstitutes these guys into the individual streams that get absorbed into the different applications, again, through these ports. So the application layer might have information coming here. The, the multiplexing stage occurs where ultimately all that information gets dumped as a stream of packets, IP datagrams, right? And then at this computer, uh, shoot. Don't look at that connection. Look at this connection. And then network access layer, IP transport layer. And let's say in this case you have two, uh, two ports. Uh, you demultiplex. You get this constant stream of packets, right? The IP datagrams. And it gets demultiplexed into multiple streams, right? That get fed into the application layer for your email, for your web browser, for Skype, for whatever, right? So, so now what, what we are concerned about is how do we handle things like, uh, for instance, uh, lost information along the way, right? So how do we handle, like, like as opposed to IP, right? IP is quite simple. We use go back in or we use uh, selective, uh, selective repeat ARQ, right? I'm missing a packet. Can you please retransmit? On the other hand, if you have um, an error in the transport layer, there is a different set of uh, there's a different set of tools that you can use in order to um, make sure that like you know you you can reconstruct in a much faster period of time. So so what happens is that reliable data transfer right? So IP is not reliable. IP what happens is drop packet drop packet drop packet drop packet. Okay, deal with it, right? So hmm. No, I'm not going to try. I was trying to think of speaking a sentence and then dropping words and say, can you figure out what I just said? Very, 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 very hard. I, you know, like, as I said, right, I'm not even, I don't do well with even one language, let alone two, right? So what happens is we use the same sort of pipelining approach. And this time, so what ends up happening is if we go back to our diagram here, we deal with what they call segments, right? So we call datagrams in the IP layer, we deal with segments. So every it's funny. So if we go back, so where did we have frames? Which layer? Mac layer? Right? So we dealt with frames. So each level has a, has a certain sort of scope of encapsulation of data plus header. So we, have, so we have the application layer. Then the application layer dumps us information. We make segments. Segments go into the IP layer. We make packets. Uh, the datagrams, if you will. The datagrams then go into the Mac layer and below, and they get formed into frames. And then eventually becomes electromagnetic energy that gets sent by wires or wireless or fiber optic cables to the other end of the network, and then we begin pulling things apart progressively, right? So it's a beautiful process. A little bit redundant, but it's nice having this modularity, if you will, right? So what we want to do is we want to do, just like we did before with RDT, but we want, instead of a go back in and a selective repeat ARQ, instead what we want is something similar, pipeline architecture. But we wanted to act on the segments, and we wanted to also work fast. Okay, So let's go back to this. So what we want to do is, remember in the last class, and no, not last class. This was also lecture 24. So we looked at how retransmissions worked in the past. So we saw there were timeouts, right? It's like, oh, I didn't get an act in like 30 seconds. I'm going to retransmit. Or if you see, remember and go back in, if you're missing a packet, right, and, and for the IP layer, and we skip one. So we get, we receive packet zero, packet one, packet three. Oh, wait, wait. We missed packet two. You still get the act of one. One, 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 one. And this is the sort of the hint. It's like, yo, sender. I think we got a problem here, in addition to the tr uh, timeout. So what do we do? So on the TCP side of things, 
So we get a sequence number just like we did with IP. And then and, and it has a particular format. You have a start timer and a track timer. And what happens is you keep track of when these guys are sent out, all these packets, and you give them designations. Not packets, segments. So segment 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, right? And there's a time. If we don't hear back with an ACK for every segment that has been sent out, then there is a problem. So what ends up happening is we use one of two mechanisms, same as before, but we're going to use them more efficiently. So the first one is timeout, OK? So timeout is is, is going to be the same as before, where what happens is uh, we retransmit if we don't hear back of an act for every segment we send out. Same as before, right? So I'm going to delete my beautiful diagram. Bye bye. And instead, just like what we, drew, we saw before, sender and then receiver. And so let's say we send one, it gets intercepted two, it gets intercepted three, zip, gets hit by lightning, four, it gets intercepted. And so what happens is this is packet one, or computer science speak, com packet zero, packet one, packet two, packet three. And we receive, so receive, yay, and then we send ACK zero, and then receive, yay. Act one, and then and then receive act three, and it's like, oh, holy smokes! Actually, it's not act three because we suddenly skipped. So we discard, right? There's no buffer and go back in. Discard uh, pa said packet, oh, boo hoo, and then what we do is we say act one, which should be the queue because when we then send the acts back. The sender will say, hey, I'm beginning to get, I have ACK0, ACK1, ACK3, and it's like, uh, sorry, ACK1. And then when I see this, I get, I, I raise the alert. I say, oh my god, I'm, I'm beginning to see a trend here. I don't see ACK2. Actually, when, when I was doing the, uh, you know, sort of the uh, process on the receiver, so ACK0, ACK1, and then it should be act three, but in fact, it's act one. When I did that pause, I was thinking about this British documentary type show on uh, Discovery Channel or something. Um, so, you know, when you do a countdown, I think it was one of those shows where it's like science shows where, you know, they're launching rockets or they're blowing up explosives and ordinances. So you have this like old British officer guy and he has like, you know, the plunger thing and sets off dynamite and stuff. And what happens is when they did the countdown there, maybe it's the British accent and stuff, they say, they, they, they count down starting at like 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 4, 3, 2, 1. And, and, and then the person, the host, maybe, it w I'm not sure, what's the name of the um, Mythbusters? I think it was Mythbusters, the speak of it. And what happens is, um, they like, you know, the lady asked, uh, saying, why, why didn't you say five? Because it sounds very familiar, it's very similar to fire. So, you know, when you say fire, it's like, pfft, you know, so, yeah. Anyways, just a slight aside. So, what ends up happening is this here, and then in addition to that, the timeout. You've waited long enough, and timeout on act two. Like, you know, we saw that that's when we start retransmitting. In the case of go back in, we send almost everything since the lost packet. Um, with selective repeat ARQ, we actually buffer on this side. So here in the case of the TCP uh, uh, RD, RDT, what we do instead, OK? So what we do is, OK, so we have an ACK of unacked segments, and then we have a timer and such. But what we do here is we set up a, what we call a fast retransmit. So this is, this, this is a slightly different beast than go back and, and, uh, and selective repeat ARQ. So first of all, the, you know, we saw timeout periods are very long. So I think yesterday, um, Elliot, you asked the question about like, you know, how long is this thing? And it's pretty darn long. So it's, like, it's almost like uh, you know, 
like the equivalent of like uh, being in an elevator with elevator music. Do, 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 do. You know, and it takes forever. So what happens is there's a little trick that TCP does instead. So what happens is you look at those duplicate a, a acts, right? So you see act one, act one, act one. What ends up happening is the TCP fast retransmit. Sure, there's a timeout thing, okay? But what TCP fast retransmit does, before you reach that stage, it says if you got three, three of the repeat acts retransmit right away, only the missing segment, right? So it has, it has the features, it has the features <coughs> of uh, selective repeat ARQ in the sense that um, it will buffer everything and just send what needs to be sent, right? And it's fast because all you need is, if you got three, pause everything, send the missing, only the, the, the most, the oldest missing information, and then let the buffer take care of the rest, all right? And so, um, and then you have the timeout as a backup. It's because what happens is suppose you're at the very end and you don't know if that was the last one or not. And if there's, and so what happens is you have the timeout just in case um, you're at the end of the queue and you lost the last segment uh, just to catch it if that fell through the cracks. So that's, that's the beauty of the fast retransmit. All you need is three. Three duplicate acts, and that's going to kick in and say, you've got a missing packet, retransmit right away, and the receiver is buffering all of that. So, and this actually gets sort of um, shown here with respect to go back in or selective repeat. So what happens is go back in, you've got the cumulative acts, right? The tick, 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 tick. You repeat it over and over again, the duplicate acts, and, and that's the cue to the sender saying there's an issue. And then it's similar also to the selective repeat because you're buffering, right? And you retransmit only the missing segment. So you got the best of both worlds, right? Um, because the buffer, memory's cheap. Memory's really cheap. I don't know how much memory is nowadays, but when I was your guys' ages, um, I remember, what was it? 128 megabytes was $560 in Canada. So even if I went to the US and bought it, it might have been just maybe $50 cheaper and stuff, even with exchange and everything. But I'm not sure nowadays, like how much can you, how much do you pay for a few gigabytes of RAM? Four gigs for not that much. I'll take that. Four, okay, so I feel really stupid. Like I should have waited about like a several decades, and I would have like saved a ton of money. But but uh, honestly, yeah. Well, I mean, the thing is, memory is really really cheap nowadays. And then on the other hand, at the same time, so memory's cheap. And then at the same time, we, if we have this very simple scheme, we don't we only have the timeout as sort of a backup, and we just keep. I think in a very aggressive way, we have this uh, sort of duplicate act thing for something relatively small, like three duplicate acts, right? Not something very long, like, oh, 20 duplicate acts later, there's an issue, all right? So flow control, okay? Flow control um, talks about, just like the name implies, um, how, how that flood of packets is going across the network, but we're not looking at the network environment. What we're looking at is the flow coming into the receiver, right? So what happens is, it's all, it's what, what happens is congestion is about the network, network congestion. Like, are the routers busy? Are the routers dropping information? Are the routers able to handle all the information I'm sending across? Are they incurring delay? Is there an issue with that? Flow control, on the other hand, is about the flow of information into the receiver itself. Can it handle it? Do I need to throttle back? It's, it's all, well, throttle back what? Throttle back the sender. So if the sender is like saying, uh, like, you know, so there is a feedback loop. I'm going to stop talking with my hands. I'm going to start talking with my pen. Here. So what happens is we go back to our di diagram, and we're going to talk about flow control. And we're going to talk about congestion. And so we go back to our diagram. 
here's our TCP, uh, sorry, t transport layer. Comms network. Okay, here's another computer. TL. Okay, and so, and inside the comms network, again, we have lots of these routers and other sort of devices that, you know, this guy here is the gateway for that computer. and then connects there, that's his gateway. And so, oh, how about we have that guy there too? And so what ends up happening, so flow control, yes, is when we have the following. So we have information, it's going from an app here. It's going through, it's going through, it's getting encapsulated all the way along different layers. Let's say it goes this way, some information, Okay. Um, let's say some information goes this way. Okay, and then it gets all added together. Remember, it gets multiplexed here, and then goes up to the application layer. And what ends up happening, the flow control part is the is happening here, and here. And so suppose that. Like, you know, for whatever reason, our application's unable to take all that information coming in at this juncture. So what happens is the transport layer here tells, and I'm going to draw a dash, dash line, but in reality, it would go through the communications network back, but just for the sake of simplicity. What happens is there's a feedback loop. There's some sort of feedback. And the feedback from the transport layer at the receiving computer it goes back to the transport layer of the sending computer, and what it's saying to it is like saying, whoa, I cannot handle all this data. My application's getting flooded, and you, you need to throttle back. You need to send less information. So what ends up happening is this guy here, you can almost think of it like a little dial, right? A little knob. And so let's say this is whatever, like, you know, throughput, the amount of data. And so what happens is you might want to decrease throughput such that this information, as it's going over here, it doesn't end up overwhelming your application at the receiver. All right? Now, congestion control is slightly different. Congestion control all happens here. Okay? And what congestion control does is Suppose you have a lot of, like, you know, congestion, right? Oh, that's a great definition. I just used the exact same word. What happens is, suppose you have routers that are getting very overloaded. Suppose you have a lot of traffic coming from other computers connected to that network. And so, you know, the amount of bandwidth available, right? Amount of bandwidth. So BW usually, at least for me, is shorthand for bandwidth. Um, is minimal. So as a result, it may or may not be able to accommodate all your information. And so whatever information does not get accommodated disappears. It drops. Can't make it across. All right? So as a result, um, we have to do something called congestion control, which is almost the same, except that we don't care. We're not so much interested in our target receiver handling it, but rather can, like, you know, we're more concerned about can the network that we're connecting these two guys to, can they handle it, all right? So that's really sort of the two differences between congestion control and, and, um, and flow control. Yes? I have two questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, first, on the congestion control, is it the network itself that tells every computer in the network I'm getting backed up? Uh, or is there, so, or is there some sort of sensor behind it? The second one. What, what ends up happening is if you're sending information and the, the, you know, the receiving guy, again, that virtual feedback loop, and it's not virtual, it's send back, right? Um, and it says to the transmitter, it says, I'm, not, I'm having this high a packet error. I'm not, I'm not getting near. So it's about stuff that is being dropped. It's, yeah. it's in regards to, okay. It, exactly, midway. So it's, not like, it's not predicted. It's not like prior to the drops. There, like once the drops start. It, although you could do, it is possible to do predictive 
if you know the time of day, and let's say you do a little bit of training of the network, you could probably extrapolate. Like, you know, in general, it would just be like the simplest thing is deterministic, or essentially, this is the quality of the transmission. I'm not getting this information across. But it, as a good research question, yeah, you could, you could try a predictive technique. So what you can do is if you can study the behavior, the past behavior of the network, um, of course, the prediction, if it's even longer, uh, further ahead in time than, 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 let's say, another type of technique, it's going to be more inaccurate. But if you can, if it, based on past experiences, time of day, even multiple days in a row, or even months. So let's say you look at the, the behavior of a network for 24-hour periods, both on weekdays and weekends for a year, right? You can tell that maybe the morning it's going to be very busy. It's going to be insanely busy between 3 and 8 p.m. because kids come home and people come home and everyone uses the network and such. And, and then on weekends, it's a little bit different. And then you can probably pre-position. You can predict what the, the network is going to be, and you can throttle accordingly. So, and, and so that, that, like, you know, it is possible. But I think just like in, the, in a very simple context, um, it will just say, I'm getting this message saying, I'm not nearly getting all the packets, something. And this guy will know. I was wondering more if like, the network, or, or there was some sense of you know, like, uh, like the network saying, I can handle this, but I'm about to reach my limit. You know, like, um, like unfortunately, I think that's where like, the network itself probably won't do that. It's really. But, but rather, the, the, the receiver is going to tell the transmitter, the sender, saying something's very wrong. And you're going to see that. You're going to see that in the um, RDT. It's going to get a lot of like, like these weird acts. And you had a second question. Yeah, the second one is about flow control. Is yeah. there, is, um, you were saying like the, the receiver would, would, you know, or, or would send in the feedback when it's getting overwhelmed. And yep. When it gets overwhelmed, is it dropping packets because yeah. Or is there like some amount of memory in the transmission? Yeah, it, if the buffer if the buffer gets filled up and it's unable it's basically the buffer is overflowing, it's it's gonna say okay. I, I can't I can't do it. So so for instance that, that program that, that box I showed yesterday is a perfect example. So you can tell whether you're dropping packets like because of the network or you're dropping packets or dropping information because the buffer is overflowing because it will, it will have these very, very somewhat subtle differences in, in terms of how that errors, those errors are occurring. So yeah, so in that case, it will be a, like a memory or, um, or, or a processing issue. It basically cannot process information fast enough. And then are these controls sent along with, I'm sorry, I don't know why. I yeah, no, 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 it's good, it's good. Are these controls sent along with? Um, with data? Yeah, so, so it, it depends on the architecture, but you can have the overhead channel in line with the data. So it can be contained in the header information going back. Uh, some, sometimes you can also have it like separate, but most of the time it will be in line with the actual information. Okay. Good question. No, it's very good because you pre, it pretty much summarizes sort of the differences between the two. So that's perfect. Good, good. Okay. So... So yes, so with, with flow control. Um, so really, like, you know, like, like for instance, like not overwhelming the receiver, right? What you want to do is, it's really, it's like a speed matching. It's almost like, and again, do not do this at home. It's like you have two cars going down the highway, and you have like a, I don't know why, but the last few weeks I've been seeing people on tight ropes on campus. I'm not sure if you folks have seen those individuals. But anyways, um, imagine you have a tight rope um, between two cars going at 70 miles per hour. And, you know, bad things happen when you don't speed match. Just like, you know, Indiana Jones. So for some miraculous reason, the big lorry is going at the exact same speed as the motorcycle, and, you know, people jump on and, you know, all that. What happens is if they don't match, you drop packets. Well, okay, no. In the, in the Indiana Jones film, the person falls off. Ah, you know. So, so what happens is... The receiver controls the sender, really. So, so it, either through those return packets, it embeds information and says, whoa, 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 that's, that's too fast. Can you please throttle down? 
right? And so, it, again, it's different than congestion control, just what I described. So what happens is there is this variable called receive buffer. And receive buffer says, this is how much space, how much memory I have available at the receiver. So this is an, bless you. So what happens is the, the, what the receiver is going to do is going to say, I have this much buffer, I have this much memory left to accommodate any unacknowledged uh, packets or segments coming my way, right? So what happens is this is the only information it really sends back. It doesn't say, whoa, it's, it's getting too busy. How do, you, how do you say that? Like, you know, like uh, as a human, I can say I'm running out of space. What does a receiver do? It just says, this is how much memory I have left to accommodate data in case there's an overflow. This is how much memory I have left. This is now how much memory I have left. And then maybe at the sender, there's a threshold, which is if I, um, let's say, if the amount of spare memory is less than this amount, I then throttle back, right? So it's almost like I'm trying to size up the receiver based on how much space he has available left at his end so I don't overwhelm him. That's really, really super duper important, all right? And so the way it works is that at the sender, so you have this flow control, and, and the receiver says, I have this much buffer, right? And the buffer size, in this case, um, you know, it auto adjusts and such. And usually, it's, you set a limit to, in this case, the number of unact in-flight data um, to, to the receiver. And the receiver has this um, something called receiver window, right? So that's, uh, so that's what stands there, the RWDN value. So the receiver window, it says, OK, here's my window. Okay, that, that, that in this case, so, we're, so what happens is, and I have that other guy over before, uh, the receive buffer size. And so what ends up happening is the, the sender limits the amount of unact to the receiver's R, RWND value. So what I do is I do not send more information or uh, segments to the receiver greater than that value because the risk of flooding, overflowing that receiver becomes quite high. So this is the receiver's way of saying, if you don't exceed this, chances are we'll be cool, right? And then there's a physical limit, which is the receive buffer size, which is if you exceed this, it's all over. So there's this one value that says, please send this size of information. Then there's receive buffer. This is how much I can physically accommodate, period. So you have, the, you have a buffer to the buffer. Right. So uh, congestion, on the other hand, is a little bit on, uh, different, right? So what in this case, uh, it's all these multiple sources sending, dumping information all in the network, trying to reach people on the other side all at the same time, right? Big mess. And it, yeah, again, it's different than flow control, and you have issues of dropped and delayed packets. Super bad. Or segments, sorry. And so what you want is uh, there is no explicit feedback from the network, right? So actually, that, that answers to a T, uh, Elliot, your question. So, so the, the thing is the network is, is just a bunch of routers. It's not going to sort of like, you know, the hive mind or something that says, like, the network is congested. No, no, no. No, what it does, oh, that would be so cool. Like, imagine, like, the network is like, you know, it suddenly has a voice. Um, but what ends up happening is, um, you, you indirectly characterize the network. Like, you know, that's the thing. Like, you might wonder, like, in terms of research. Uh, so this is a, a great, uh, great plug for doing university research, right? Or MQPs. Um, it's always really neat if you can do something adaptive, right? So you can have, like, these heuristic, very built-in functions. Say, if you reach this level, do that. If you do this, do that. But more intelligent, like, you know, there's all, like, given the cost and power of embedded technology and computational horsepower and memory and such, you have a lot of advantages to, if you can figure out what the characteristics of the network are, you can make something adaptive or even predictive. You can sound out the network, you can look at past behavior, and you can say, oh, okay, uh, based on Monday on April 3rd, no, not April 30th, so that was yesterday, and looking at April 30th, 2014, I would predict that I would have this type of network behavior. 
at, and let's say, at 5 p.m. then and 5 p.m. now. And let's look at also 5 p.m. from April 30th of 2013, 2012. Like, so what happens is you can characterize approximately what the behavior of your network is going to be like, right? There might be some odd incidents, incidences. Like, for instance, um, if there's like a bit of, like the equivalent of a flash crowd. So, like, what do I mean by that? But, so let's say, and I'm not sure how this would work. Like, let's say you really want to swamp the network all at the same time. So you all boot up and you all use, like, you know, stream YouTube videos all at the same time and see if you can stress the network, right? Uh, that would be a sort of an odd event unless you do it every May 1st at 3.45 p.m. Uh, for the next five years. And then someone's going to say, what, what the heck is going on? The good thing is I'm, I'm teaching this course at least next year. So we can do that again on May 1st at 3.45. So CCC is going to love me. So what happens, so what happens is um, you have two parameters. You have C window, right? And so what this guy is, this is your um, window size for your congestion control. And um, RTT is round trip time. Okay? So this is actually a really important value. So things like ping, right? Ping, like when you did ping, right, at the IP level, you send a packet or you send a stream of packets and, and then it returns to whatever target is. And you do it over and over again and you know how much time it takes to go from point A to point B. So here you have this round trip time. It sends these C win bytes, okay, this number of bytes, and it waits for the RTT, for the acknowledgement. So, so you're sending information, then you're waiting for the acts to come back, and then you can assess how long it's going to take. And now you know what your TCP data rate is. So what happens is if you do the slow start, so what, what goes on here, so what you're trying to do is you're throttling your information extremely slowly so that if you have a very busy network, so you put a little bit of information on it, and then you put a little bit more information on it, and then you gradually increase the amount of information until you get your first loss. So what you do is, it's, it, it makes sense, right? It's like you try something out. So the equivalent would be if you make your own table. So how many people here make your own furniture? Okay. If anyone wants to learn how to make a chair, let me know. I'm, I don't say I'm good at it, but, but let's say one thing I do is let's say I make a table or I make a chair, and I want to see it's reliable. And, and how's that? So let's say I'm trying to think. If I sit on it and it holds my weight, then it's pretty good because in the Wiglinski household, I'm the heaviest. Captain, 70 pounds. I'm not going to disclose what my wife weighs, but she definitely weighs less than me. Um, if it was a Wiglinski family household, then it's a battle between my dad and me. So even though he's a little bit shorter, you know, age takes its time, a toll on people, right? So what happens is, how do I see if something is going to accommodate at least someone like me? I sit on it. And then you put a fudge factor maybe 50% heavier too, right? So you get like a few sandbags and you add and you add. And let's say before you add, so how much am I? I'm about 190-ish and stuff. So let's say, so 50% more, so let's say 300 pounds. So you add and add. And what happens is, if it fails before 300 pounds, then I'm not going to use that chair. So you have to see my backwoods. I have like all these trash chairs because, let's just say I don't make chairs very strong. But what ends up happening, the TCP approach is very much the same way. I saw an, send, well, you might ask, what is MSS? It's maximum segment size. So you send one max seg size. Then you send two. Then you send three. And then at some point, you keep on sending until what is the number where you start getting a failure, right? So you keep track of that number. And so, so you're basically doubling, bless you, doubling and doubling and doubling. And then you find out, OK, where's the loss? Boom. And so when you have that loss, you time out, right? You have that time out. And, and then you, you grow exponentially, just like in the slow start. So the next step is you, and, and you set the threshold. So now what you do is when you did the incremental slow start, you now know at least, I wouldn't say it's totally reliable because um, it's statistically, statistically not strong because you're just looking for one fluke. It could have been a bad day. It could have been everybody transmitting at that same time. But let's say we keep it simple. So we had an error, 
and we had this much information that we were dumping onto the network, and that's when it failed. So then we now ramp it up really quickly. Instead of doubling, what we now do is we exponentially increase it all the way to halfway of where it failed, right? And then from there, we then do linear until we fail again, all right? So that's how this guy works. And then finally, um, you know, if we want to switch from, from, from these modes, so, you know, we have that halfway value. So what we need, because sometimes, because networks vary a lot, right? We have a variable sort of threshold to set, right? So that SS thresh is set by doing that incremental thing, right? And so we have that variable um, SS threshold. And again, we always set it to half of where the failure occurs. And, um, and, and, and then from there, what happens is we retry, 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 and failure might occur later or sooner. So that threshold is varying across time until the next failure and stuff. But this way, we, we, kind of, we kind of get that information across, and we're pushing the limits. And when it does fail, OK, OK, okay. We, we, we went too far. We'll back off. Yes? Yep, because the network is always in flux. It's always changing and such. But what happens is we, like, we have the first slow start to get a good understanding of how congested the network is. Right. But then after that, we're, we ramp up like super fast, halfway, and then we see, can we push it just a little bit more? And act. So again, going back to the chair analogy, let's say I come up with a design and it failed at 250 pounds. And then what happens is I make another exact design and assume the material stays the same. What I'll do is I'll start, like, so, so let's say it failed at 250 pounds. I'll right away, in this case, put 125 pounds because I'm sure it's not going to fail there. That assumes if my workmanship is the same as in the last chair. And then I would slowly add additional weight again, right, until it fails. Very bad for the environment, I can tell you that, all those, those chairs. So, so as a result, this is how we kind of like sort of we size up the network. And, and that threshold does change because, again, it is a fluke. On the other hand, if we're more intelligent, what we would do is we would monitor. Let's say we try the same linear increase, ramping, and then say, OK, that, that, that threshold was too aggressive that time and too conservative that time, and then take the average or maybe take the lower bound. And we know that we would be able to transmit unless there's a real fluke. Okay. So with that, uh, that is lecture 26 of ECE 2305. Okay. So don't forget, Tuesday is, is Beach Ball Tuesday.